Hello everybody, welcome to Owen Automotive. I'm Richard Michael Owen, and we're gonna do a bit of a shop diary, giving a slice of the daily work here at the shop. So we got a couple of really cool items in the shop. One is this AC Asica engine. It's an all aluminum block, aluminum oil pan, and the cast iron heads over here, I just walked by it. So here's the cast iron head, the roller rockers, the starter, pressure plate and flywheel. So we'll be taking this thing apart and evaluating it for rebuild. That'll be a pretty interesting little segment. And also we have this 1967 E-Type Roadster up on the hoist. And this car is gonna be interesting. There's something that's happened to the clutch. So the engine's coming out. Let me grab my light, light it up. So we are ready to remove this engine and transmission. It comes out from the bottom as one. I have tied up the rear transmission mount. See that cotter pin there? That holds that spring unit together. Then we have to remove the motor mounts. They're up in there and we'll drop it out. So that'll be the first thing we do. Let's get into it. So getting really close to extracting the engine and transmission out of this Jaguar. But the one trick to it is while it's sitting here like this with all the weight off the motor mounts is that we have to deal with the angle drive here on the transmission. I'm just gonna go tight in here. So here's the angle drive right here. And to get enough room, you need to move it. See, I'm moving the whole transmission to the side and that gives enough room to withdraw it. So this is a really important detail that you need to get right for both installing and removing an XK engine. So I'm gonna get this out, then we'll lower it down. Okay, so we'll see how much clearance we need. There we are. So this is the setup. This is how to remove an E-type engine the easy way. Got on the hydraulic hoist. The engine is fully suspended right now. It's balanced right in the middle. And then this thing's gonna have to drop just over a foot. You can see the pan there and the platform. We're putting it on. So the technique here is literally just drop the engine down then raise the car on the hoist. And while we're doing this, we have to respect that we're gonna be pulling the transmission away from these drive shaft bolts. So let's give it a try. Okay, let's wiggle this thing out of here. Going down. curious to see what's hiding in this bell housing so uh, let's have a look here Looking pretty normal so far, so I'm going to take off the pressure plate and see what the clutch disc looks like. It wasn't letting go earlier, so lots of meat on the release bearing. I wonder what's going on here. 
gonna put a bearing shell here to stop the engine from turning. Because I want to take this pressure plate off in an even manner all the way around. I want to mark it, that's a good point. So you want to mark the pressure plate here to make sure it goes on in the same spot because these are balanced. We'll go right up here at the top. So I usually just clean it off with a little bit of brake cleaner. That way I know my paint's going to stay there. And just in case this pressure plate needs to go back on, I won't be changing the balance of the engine. There we are. Now we can take it off. Oh, jeez. Wow. Oh, that was over tightened. Okay, moment of truth. What do we got? What do we got? Disc is stuck to the pressure plate. See how rusty that is? And this is stuck to the pressure plate right now. The disc is welded rusted. right onto the it's pressure rusted plate. On. It's rusted on. And we couldn't get it off any other way. Yeah. Look at that. That's what it is. It's just rust. It's been sitting for so long. Yeah, that's what it is. Wow. Moisture. Lots of moisture. A lot of work just because it didn't drive the car. Yeah, when these things sit, they seize up. You can see the rust right on the flywheel here. And the clutch was stuck to the pressure plate. Look at that. Oh, you know what? Let's get this on film here. There it is. Rust it on. Just weld it on there. You feel how rusty that is. Feel how rusty yeah. that is. Holy moly, it's just like sandpaper, it just glued it right on there and there was no way that was freeing off. All right, now I've figured out that Jaguar clutch, it was rusted on the pressure plate. Can get onto this AC Asica engine, which is gonna be pretty fun. So I already showed everybody the cast iron cylinder head. We'll have to take the valves out of here, evaluate the seats and the guides. But the main event today is stripping down this block I was looking up the history of these engines, and this is a design dating back to the 1920s. AC developed this and called the Light 6, and that was because it was all made of aluminum alloy, and because of that, I think this top surface generally has a lot of issues with corrosion. So we're gonna clean up this surface and have a good look at it. You can see the stamping number here. So this is engine number 2441. It's one of the very last two liter AC engines made, and it's very high specification, 9.0 to one compression. So I think this is basically the ultimate version of this design that dates back to the pre-war engine. See it has an external oil filter here. We'll take that off, move over to the other side. You can see the water pump as well. It has external water jacket. That's pretty unusual. Definitely pre-war and external water pump. So I'll take that off as well, and we'll start taking it apart. Another thing I learned too is the, the chiming chain tensioner here. It's just a, it's just a blade type system. I think AC called this a, a slipper system, and the patent for this design rests with this engine. This is the first time it was employed. All right, let's start taking it apart. Okay, let's take the water pump off. You note all the threads and hardware on this thing are, are British Standard. So British Standard Fine, British Standard Whitworth. So here we're gonna get our first look at the water pump impeller. Looks intact, looks pretty clean. Bearing feels good. Nice. Pretty strange looking impeller. Looks like it's made of an alloy, like a bronze or something. Okay, next the housing. There we go. I hope this is aluminum. It'll be much easier to deal with if it's aluminum. There we are. It's got the external water passage off. See the fuel pump there? It has a bit of a bushing it runs in. So next up, gonna remove these oil pan bolts. You could drop the pan see what the bottom looks like. 
All right, I got all the bolts holding the oil pan off. Let's see if it'll just tap out. Oh, there it goes. I've... There it is. All right, got that big aluminum oil pan off. Pretty nice looking unit. Has the oil pump housing built in. It's got the drive here that has to be set up properly when the oil pan gets reinstalled. And the suction tube there with the mesh, which protected against large objects like that nut that was sitting down in there. So I'm really curious. Let's see what this bottom end looks like on this AC motor. Wow, look at the oil lines in there. Oh, holy, look at that oil pump drive on there, the gear. <laughs> That's amazing. Wow. The main oil pump line is external. It's not built in at all. So spend some time surveying what we have here more in the work required. Definitely notice some cool details. The engine number is stamped down here. See that? 2441. Then the rear seal. Well, there is no seal. It's just a scroll. So we're going to have to have a look at the condition of that. Here's the timing gear section. It's well supported with two main caps. I believe this one is of a different size. Then there's that huge oil pump gear that I spotted earlier. And this external oiling system it has these really interesting like fingered lock tabs. So this is the first thing that's going to have to come off. Then I think I want to deal with these rod caps. The rods are all numbered. So you can see this one's number five right here. And these numbers are towards the driver's side. So that's pretty easy. So you're going to start taking this apart all the while respecting those wet liners. See down in there, the cylinder liners? Those are wet liners. They're steel liners. Don't want to knock those loose. You can also see the cylinder head stud poking through down there. So it runs all the way from the bottom to the top of the block through the aluminum. Okay, got number five loose here, so we can have a look at our first bearing. Hopefully they're not Babbitts, eh? <laughs> shell bearings, please. These later engines have shell bearings, I believe. That's the top of a little bit here. Little there. This case comes flying out, I guess. Here we go. What do we got? Here we got a nap. A little bit of something run through there. Scratched it a bit, hey? Yeah, some particulate, but the bearing itself looks like good wear, doesn't it? Uh huh. All right, made some progress. Sorry I didn't record all of this. Got all the nuts for the main caps off, all the rod caps are off, and disconnected the distributor drive and checked to make sure we clocked it right at top dead center. So now we should be able to remove these five main caps and withdraw the crankshaft out with the timing gear connected. That one's just sitting there. Mm. Holy. Looks good, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, looks nice. Crank looks pretty good there too. That huge gear is so wild. It drives all the timing. So these caps are aluminum and they have a steel plate on the top, right? Mm-hmm. Strap, they call that. The strap. A little notch to locate the caps and the notch. Oh yeah, look at the notch there. Notch is in there. Too. That's particular.
Some lines in that one, eh? No scratches, but nothing really big wear marks. So the front main cap looking pretty good. Mm -hmm. You can see the front seal on there too. Probably should have taken this damper up beforehand, but we'll take it off afterward. And we got one more near the rear seal here. That's it, should be a lift up. Oh, look how small that one is. Only oil thrower on there. Oil thrower. I think this one is actually a different dimension. It's slightly smaller. All right, everything's apart now. Really happy with the progress. Got this crankshaft out. We had to get the right angle just for the clearance of this big timing gear to the cylinder block. So next up, really got to do a thorough clean of all the components and accurately measure them. Bearing surfaces do look pretty nice though. Got to clean that oil pan down there, get the pump out, see what that looks like, and definitely clean the cylinder block. Now I took a distributor drive out here. I'll just show you where that was because it was hard to film with everything in there. So yeah, it just slides out right here. See that? There's that big bushing there in the block that this goes into. So when we put this back in, we'll have to clock it the right way. But yeah, I think this cylinder block's gonna clean up really nice being all aluminum. I gotta get the paint stripper out. I gotta give this a solvent wash. It's gonna be a bit of work. So the pistons themselves. Now, five of them were, are looking pretty good, but one here is it scored pretty severely. Um, these might actually be the original pistons. I'll show you the top of one here. I took a picture. It says Wellworth on it and it has a part number. Now, Wellworth were the original piston manufacturer for AC, so it's a good chance these are the original pistons for the engine, and they're split piston type too. Now, this scoring too, I should say, that may be because this car sat at one period and got slight corrosion on the bore, or it might be an overheat event. But yeah, it's too bad, otherwise we could probably reuse this complete set. So yeah, lots of cleaning to do ahead of me, but it's gonna be a jewel of an engine once it's all cleaned and ready to go in the car. Yeah, there goes Andy. He just brought us this amazing 1962 fixed head to do some work on. We'll get it in the shop and uh, get into the details. But yeah, low mileage, dark green example, looking great in the sun here. Wow. Sounds good. Get the fan work in there. Wow, look at that. What a privilege it is to get cars like this, low mileage, 62 coupes like this, and for servicing. So yeah, this job's gonna be pretty interesting. The car has been sitting in my local area here since 2014. So we're gonna do a full maintenance, lube and oil on this car, as well as some detail things I noticed on the car that the new owner would like addressed. I'll show you what I mean. Look at the headlight scoop area here. The paint here is pretty cheesy. It's just this really cheap looking spray bomb metallic. It's gonna make that a little nicer. Also try to put some headlights in there that are better looking than these cheap Wagner halogens. And then the sugar scoop itself, I wanna fit it properly to the car. See that gap down in there? That shouldn't be there. So just properly fit them, space them out, paint them, make them look better. At the same time, I'm gonna Respect this chrome finisher piece here. This chrome strip should not run underneath the surround. It's making the surround kind of 
land proud of the bonnet. And then over here, this bumper here, it's loose. So that'll be nice to address once I have the sugar scoop area out. These early bumpers, there's no access underneath, so I have to get in through the sugar scoop area. So it'll be nice to address all of this at once and fill in these holes as well. It used to have a guard that ran across the front, a rather ugly guard. Now being a very low mileage car, I think this is 42,000 original miles. When we open the hood here, bear with me. We'll see lots of good original stuff including the original radiator. Look at that down in there. That really tells a story when a car still has its original radiator. Just get my lighting here. So that's the Marston Excelsior radiator, the original one. I've only seen a handful of cars that have that fitted that do not leak. You can see a chassis number here, 885841. So this is the 841st left-hand drive E-type coupe. It looks very nice under the hood. Very nice shape under the hood as well. And if you have a look at the data tag here, what you would expect, really nice, clean, clean, crisp lines, no drama. And this car doesn't look like it's ever been apart. It's just had a respray. So it's gonna be fun to do this. We'll get into that sugar scoop area and do that. We're also gonna put on some new tires. Got some wonderful set of Michelin XVS to put on this thing. And the tan interior is nice too. No one document. I'll show you guys is the original registration document for this car when it was delivered to the customer in England. And he drove it around on this 1062 plate before it was delivered to his permanent residence in the USA in Vermont, I believe. So it's really cool to have the original English registration plates with this car. What a treat. So yeah, let's get into it. down with some dum-dum so I just want to be careful I don't want to bend it it's pretty fragile oh yeah there we go here we go going back in. okay yeah it had some dum-dum mastic in there holding it on nice looking piece Okay, with that glass out, you can kind of see the cheesy finish of this. I definitely can see how it's not set up correctly in this big gap. So we'll take this out and I'll show everybody how I'm gonna fix this. Also, a few dents in here from when it was taken in and out. So it'll be nice to repaint it and fix that. All right, let's take this sugar scoop out. It should fall into the aperture here it's on three studs I'll show you what those look like yeah there's not much room to grab there we go it goes down in and out it comes okay so I got the sugar scoop out you can see the nasty rattle can silver in here in the original opalescent hue underneath this is opalescent gunmetal just like some of the cars that were painted on the outside. So I'm gonna return it to its original hue. I'll paint them up, make them look nice, and also respect the fastening system. So here's a captive nut at a 1032 screw. And the way Jaguar did it is they used nuts or spacers on three of these studs here, just to point this thing in the right direction and get it merry and nice with the leading edge of the aperture. So with the sugar scoop out, could definitely have an inspection here on the inside of the hood 
and this is absolutely remarkable. You can see the hinge thread plates there look really nice. We'll clean those up, put some penetrant on those to get those freed up. And there's the horn. The early cars have the horn in here as well. So it's kind of a pain to service that. And the bumper. So the bumper bolts are accessed now from the inside. You can just see the one at the top there protruding. So I'll be able to address the bumpers. And also this chrome finisher, I drew a line. So we're gonna have to make that proud of the bodywork and cut it to fit. So yeah, doing a lot of things here all in one, but I think it's gonna make a big difference for this car. Time to get back working on the white E-type, have the parts in the clutches in. So it's time to get that going. Now I've been doing a bit of work since you guys saw this engine last. I cleaned it up and I did the core plugs, the frost plug, freeze plugs for the water jacket here. And I took out these thin flanged plugs and I put in the much um, thicker ones, the American style ones. You can see the part number in there. There it is right there. And that has a better chance of not leaking. So doing that, while the engine's out of the car. Also resealed the gearbox. So new seals and new gaskets for that. Now the flywheel here was a bit of a journey. I'm not gonna lie. Had it resurfaced and figured out that there was 77 thou missing and also found that the crankshaft flange was a little bit out. So you can see this absolutely amazing shim my friend Chris Foreman made at Foreman Machine. And now this thing's running nice and true. So the next step's gonna be getting the pressure plate on with the clutch and mounting the gearbox on. We're kicked. Uh, yes. There you go. We gotta go down a bit. I think it's too high. Way too high. Oh yeah. <laughs> Still a little too high. There you go. I gotta get that pilot machine started. <laughs> Time for a marriage. Got the engine all set up. About four years ago, I did a video called How to Install Your E-Type the Easy Way, and it covers a lot of this stuff. So getting the slave cylinder all set up there, the starter. Now I like to renew this hard line right here in steel because it takes a bit of a brunt when it gets installed. And also, I install these bolts, these two bottom ones backwards. It just gives more room for the reaction plate to go up in there. Yeah, so let's drop the car down on top of this. I think we got clearance here. Look at that. See you later, engine. Okay, I think we can pick it up now. All right, gonna lift it up, but I have to respect two things. One is the clutch line down there, that one I had just made. Well, I pinched it when we tried to bring it up last, and I don't know if it's quite so visible, but we have to make sure the motor is very close towards the firewall so that this torsion bar bracket doesn't interfere with the line as it comes up. 
Definitely want to get the engine stabilizer bar into the engine stabilizer up here. That'll make life a lot easier. And another thing to note is the tack drive is out. They're very valuable. I think they're about $300, so I'd like to take those out. It lets me move the engine further closer to the firewall so I don't nick that clutch line down there. Okay, let's load her up. On the driver's side. Lots of room, that's nowhere near it. It's a foot from it. Not the trigger on it, maybe? This is fine. You've got lots of room on the hoist to go up here. Yeah. It's coming up. Look at that, everybody. Put your finger there. there you go. How do we look on the clutch line now? No, not near it yet. Okay. Okay, now we're kind of bound up a bit. So this is gonna be it for the white car in this episode. The engine and transmission are in. Now the first thing I always want to do with a clutch job, or really putting any engine and transmission into a car, is check the clutch operation. I want to make sure the throw-up bearing is doing its job, the interference to the flywheel is correct, because if there's an error there, I want to make sure I get that correct before I proceed any further. So yeah, I got the brake bottles out of here and the clutch reservoir bottle out of here to clean that up. I'll reverse bleed that. It'll be the first thing I check. And I know what everybody thinks, that's a lot of work for a rusty clutch disc, but hey, that's the way it goes. And while we're in there, we sealed up the block, new core plugs, we sealed up the leaky gearbox, so we were able to address a lot of niggling issues. Just gonna fast forward a little bit on this green fixed head. With the sugar scoops out, I could get to the bumper hardware and deal with the left-hand side, which was loose. And at the time, it looked okay from a distance, but then I told the owner, look, this chrome's pitted, maybe we should do something about it, and he agreed. So I've spent a lot of time trying to set up all this chrome as best I can, because you want to get it right before chroming. Chroming is really, really expensive. And that's done, believe it or not, by grinding and fitting to the car, and going back and forth, back and forth. And the result here on the passenger side is what I'm looking for. I'll show you what I mean. This blade right here, it runs really nicely with the edge of the bonnet all the way around. That means that rubber that goes in there is gonna seat really nicely. And then the blade itself is sitting, uh, it's not dipped down or up. That's another thing that I hate to see on E-tapes is that blade dipping down or up. The guard can be shifted a little bit. It's gonna be mounted on rubber, so that's not an issue. But what I found is on the past, on the driver's side, sorry, I was getting pretty good results all the way around, but the dip for the blinker, it's just too far rearward. And if I move the whole blade forward, it pushes everything into the center of the car far too much and the motif bar wouldn't fit. So I'm gonna try to find another blade for the driver's side of this car. And when that comes, I'll show you the fitting process and we'll get into it a little further. But why is this happening? Well, that's because I don't think any of these are original pieces. They're all pieces from varied sources and they just do not coalesce without a lot of fettling. But I'm really happy with this passenger side. So yeah, let's see what that new blade does to the fit of these bumpers. Okay, a bit of a privilege here. We're back with the Preservation E-Type. I did five episodes on this car and we brought it back to a mechanically running condition and left the exterior completely factory original. So what am I looking at here? I'm looking at the bumper as we did on the other 62. And I'm looking at the chrome finisher here and I can see it definitely doesn't protrude down past the rubber and how it coalesces here with the surround. And a lot like the car we're working on, the cutout here for the bumper is slightly rearward, maybe to a lesser degree on this car but it definitely, the cutout, the dip down for the blinker isn't exactly in the right spot. So I find that pretty interesting that both these cars kind of suffer from that. Then if I step back here, you can see the symmetry of it all. 
And what do we got here? Yeah, this car isn't perfect either. The guards are kind of splayed out. And if I was getting pretty picky, I think the passenger side one is just slightly down. So if we go in here, have a look at how the rubber's handled. You can see it definitely wraps all the way around, so it's kind of dark in here. And I got a cross section of this rubber. Here's what it looks like. It's actually slightly smaller than the later cars. So I'm gonna try my best to see if I can find this slimmer design rubber. So yeah, very interesting. You can see how there's not a lot of room here for the guard. It almost kisses the bodywork. So I'm gonna to try to replicate these features on the car we're working on. It's really neat to see cars like this where the bumper's never been off. It's pretty rare actually. Yeah, pretty sweet car. Well, the narrative is changing. So since seeing that original car, going back and looking at the preservation E-Type, definitely noticed that it also had a slight discrepancy with the lights. And I found some new information. My dad said, well, why don't you measure the placement of the blinker driving light in the fender? And as it turns out, this side is one inch too close to the center line of the nose. And that's why the bumper doesn't fit. And where this is sitting is in factory original metal with no adjustment for movement. So I'm stuck with this. I'm gonna do kind of what the factory did and that is assemble the pieces with rubber in between and try to get it the best I can without reinventing the wheel here. And I was wrong, These the bumper blades on this car were the original blades. I'm gonna put on some new guards that we got from SG Barrett and try to fit it as best we can. So let's see how this goes. Okay, we're getting there and I'm really happy with the fit of this bumper assembly. So you saw the technique there. Me and my dad put it on as a complete unit and that really helps because this motif bar here has really specific spacing and it needs to be set up right and installed with the system and it has these two bolts that go in from behind. So it's really nice to get this done before it goes on the car. So I'll tighten those down and that'll be the last thing that'll set this all in place. And the way I went forward with this was just plating the, the blades and the motif bar and then getting new guards from SNG Barrett and it worked out quite well. I know there's this one inch discrepancy here where this light is too far forward, but I think it's gonna be fine unless somebody pointed it out. I don't think anybody will notice. Now, while I was in here, I did free up the bolts on the stud plate for the hinge mechanism down there. That means, um, those won't, you can only access those right now before the sugar scoop, headlight scoop goes back in. And that's another story. I'll show you over here on the bench. This is the original hue of the sugar scoop. I was really happy to discover. And this is what I paid a professional to do a color match for me. And I'm so glad I saved some of the original paint because you can see that's off by a country mile. It's kind of frustrating when you pay professionals and they don't get it right because not only am I going to have to go back and talk to the, my paint mixer, but it also sets me back a few days because I wanted to get those sugar scoops in and get all this system fully installed. But I guess that's for another time. That's just the way it goes with classic cars. You have to have a lot of patience. Okay, to end this episode, let's have a look at that AC engine. We got it all cleaned up and measured. So a bit of an update with the AC block. You can see here the result of my labor. I paint stripped this thing, I solvent cleaned it, then I acid cleaned it. And I think that's the right way to go with this rare aluminum block engine. That's because I don't like abrasive. It tends to dull the surface and it embeds material into the aluminum. I'm just not a fan. I instead just prefer to clean it the manual way. And I think this looks pretty good. Now, I've been talking to the specialists in England, there are a few, and this is quite a tricky engine to find parts for, I'm not gonna lie. 
And all the specialists I talk to say that these wet liners here, they need to be replaced every time you do a major service on these engines. And that's because at the bottom, there's aluminum and copper gasket that has the right amount of crush for it for the cylinder head gasket. And in fact, I believe in the manual, it says every time the head comes off, these sleeves need to be changed, believe it or not. Now this block does look really good. If you look at the top of it, there's just minimal corrosion, so it's definitely usable. And the specialist Rod Briggs in England, if this surface isn't good enough, he replaces the whole top half of the block. I'll show you some pictures. It's really impressive feat of engineering. And it's great to have people like Rod in England to support engines like this. So moving over to the table here, we can see the crankshaft. Very unusual design with the spur gear. And to machine it, it all has to come apart because this journal, you cannot access it unless this spur gear comes off, which means pressing off the flange of the crank, including the sprocket. So that's a lot of work. And this crank needs it. It's two thou out of round. So a bit of um, research to do with this. Definitely have to find some bearings we can use and then grind the crank according to what's available. Now, the cylinder head isn't very good news either. I'll show you what I mean. There's an appreciable crack here on number two that goes from the combustion chamber to the water jacket. Now this wasn't causing any running. The car was running fine, but when we put new pistons in there and increase the compression, I think that's when this is gonna be an issue. So looking for a new cylinder head or repairing what we have here, it's cast iron, so it's not so simple. And lastly, yes, I'll show you my new project. This is a restoration 1969 Series 2 rust-free, accident-free car. And we're going to go the distance on this one. Really excited. I think it's going to be a high-performance build. So, guys, if you have a Series 2 looking like this, and we're going to create a beautiful body and paint on it. I mean, look at the inside here. All the floors are intact. So, yeah, what upgrades would you do? What would you do to this Series 2 to make it a high-performance build? I know top of my list is triple carburetors, but I'm curious what everybody else has in mind. All right. Okay, well, that does it for this video. That's about a month's worth of work. I love to share it with you guys. If, again, if you have any tips, tricks, comments, or trade secrets, I love to hear from everybody in the comments below. Thanks for watching, everybody. See you later. Bye-bye.